everybody, and thank you for attending today's session. So in today's session, we're going to be going through conducting effective assessments um, and looking at the standards uh, and what it relates to. But the big thing is, is making sure that you have a good understanding of how we're mapping the assessment tools uh, to meet the requirements of the uh, standards. Okay, so you should be able to see my... PowerPoint. Yep, Amanda's giving me the confirmation there. Okay, all right. So welcome today. I can see we've got a few people online. So uh, great to see you all there online today. Now, if you have any questions, uh, please make sure that you pop them in the chat, particularly since it's about assessment tools, which is really big for what we need to know right now. The reason why we've only doing uh, standard 1.8 to 1.8 uh, one, two today is because assessments is a very big subject. Uh, and it's very big when it comes to making sure that we're complying with the requirements of not only the standards, but also uh, the training packages as well. So as per usual, this webinar forms part of your continuous improvement process under standard 2.2. Following this webinar, we highly recommend that you hold a monthly meeting. And at that monthly meeting, you should record anything that needed to be updated. So if you needed to update your policies and procedures uh, to make sure that it's aligning with your practices, or maybe you need to align your practices with the policies and procedures. So it's uh, stating that you've uh, tabled these, these standards at the meeting for today and also reviewing the policy and procedure as per the Q&C manual. You should also uh, be recording this as part of your continuous improvement process, uh, anything that you've updated uh, within your minutes of your Q&C meeting. Um, if you should, you should also review any documentation that may relate to this as well. As, um, also, make sure that you pop any questions that you have in the chat. I will be answering those as we go along. I know we've got the Q&A option as well, but I, I prefer the chat. So, um, and make sure that you put it um, in the chat for everyone. So uh, other people can see, if, if, particularly if you want other people to see the question, uh, I can see all of the questions anyway, uh, when you pop them in there. Uh, the more questions that we get, the more interactive this training becomes. Okay, so what is standard 1.8? Uh, standard 1.8 is all around assessment tools and it's making sure that your assessment tools comply with the requirements of the training package. And the best way to do this and to make sure that you are complying is to conduct assessment validation. So validating your assessment tools to make sure that you're collecting sufficient evidence against each of the units of competencies that you are delivering. So we'll be going through that and I'm also going to go through having a look at mapping. So when you're looking at mapping your assessment tools um, and breaking down a unit of competency and what the requirements are within that. Assessment tools are quite often the top non-compliance when we go to an ask for audit. Um, and typically it's non-compliant against the uh, unit of competency requirements or the assessment conditions. And it does not meet the rules of evidence and principal assessment requirements. So that's where we really focus when we're auditing, uh, but also when we're looking at the training is making sure that you're compliant against all of those requirements. Uh, the other thing is, is that the assessment tools haven't been contextualized for your learner cohort. So you may have identified in your training and assessment strategies, who your learner cohort is, if your assessment tools do not match the learner cohort requirements, then that can be a non-compliance as well. Because that's the big thing is if you've identified a certain learner cohort, your assessment tools should meet their needs. Uh, so it's making sure that you've contextualized those. So for example, if your students are existing workers and they're currently within the workplace, you should have contextualized your assessment tools so that they could be conducted within the workplace. Uh, and there are observations that could be done in the workplace or there's um, assessments that could be conducted in the workplace. Another example could be uh, new entrants to the market. 
if you have new entrants to the market, there are going to be other requirements that you're going to need to have in your assessment tools because they're very new uh, and they're going to need to learn a lot more and you're going to need to cover a lot more. So um, it's making sure that it's contextualised to them. It's really important that you uh, validate your assessment tools at least annually. Uh, I recommend that you hold two sessions a year, but at least annually you're con um, undertaking a validation process. Uh, and then the other one that can often, it's not a non-compliance, it just makes it more difficult to understand where the uh, compliance requirements are not being met is there's no mapping tool. So we'll be going through the mapping tool process today uh, so that you have a better understanding of how to uh, use the mapping tool. Okay, I'm just making sure that my volume is fine. Can you hear me fine? Awesome, all right, because I was just on my headset before, so I just thought I better make sure. Okay, assessment practice. Uh, so it is a requirement for, as an RTO, that you need to develop a system to ensure that the assessment judgments uh, that you are carrying out are consistently being made on a sound basis and that it, you have consistency with your assessments and how you're conducting your assessments. And the best way to do that is to validate the assessment tools. tools. A student must be assessed against all the requirements of the tasks identified within the elements of the unit or the module and demonstrate they are capable of performing these tasks to an acceptable level within a workplace. So it will be uh, to meet the vocational requirements within the workplace. Student competency is absorbed through uh, the knowledge developed, uh, you're developing their skills and it can be combined, the knowledge and the skills to demonstrate their ability to be able to complete the unit um, and meet those requirements within the workplace or within a workplace scenario. Uh, and that you've got consistency of performance and consistency of how they're demonstrating those skills. So this is where it's really important as uh, with your assessment tools, is that you have clear instructions to the student and clear instructions to the assessor on how to conduct the assessment. And that is how we ensure that we have consistency with those assessments. Also understanding what they are doing and why they are doing it. So that's where you've got it in those instructions. So it's nice and clear um, what they're required to perform. Uh, and the ability to integrate performance with their understanding uh, to show they are able to adapt to different contexts and environments. And this is where conducting assessment under different environments and on a number of occasions is really good for ensuring their knowledge and skills within the unit. Something that we see is missing quite a bit is you know, within assessment tools is observable skills and that you're able to utilise within your assessment tool some sort of observation uh, technique that you may be using and that depends on the unit of competency. Uh, but a big thing is, and I'm going to be going through this, is looking at the foundation skills. And if in the foundation skills it has anything about uh, communication skills, uh, has anything about demonstration or being, uh, being job ready, uh, we're going to be wanting to see some sort of observation tool that you would have in place. Uh, and the big thing is with the um, having an observation tool is making sure that you're consistent between not only how you're assessing each student, but you're also how is each trainer delivering their training and assessment and ensuring consistency between trainers and assessors and having that benchmark. It's making sure that we're collecting sufficient evidence to demonstrate that the student is competent. And a lot of the times the assessment tools are going to be require that you're going to need to do a uh, observation of those uh, skills within the workplace. Okay. Um, okay, so the ideal, um, the ideal assessment tool is, and, and this is a really big area where you need to identify, okay, what, what would be the best assessment tool for me to put in place for the types of assessments that we're going to be conducting or the industry sector that we're working with? So you should be really looking at uh, and breaking it down from the unit of competency. 
So um, an ideal assessment tool would have comprehensive checklists uh, that you could use for observation or demonstration, um, or it could also be a checklist for uh, knowledge-based skills. It should have a very clear guidance to the student and the assessor. So for the assessor, how to conduct the assessment. And for the student, it is what is their responsibilities when they are going through the assessment? What are they required to, what evidence are they required to collect? And what are they required to demonstrate uh, within their assessment? So it's very clear what they would be required to do. In particular, if you have on the job, what are they required to access while they're on the job? Is there equipment that they need to access? Uh, do they need to have a supervisor observe them? What are the requirements that the student must meet uh, when undertaking the assessment? Observation assessment includes observable skills. So making sure that any observation assessment that you do addresses the observable skills that the assessor must observe within the student. Uh, what we often find is that there are quite a few assessment tools where they've just converted the knowledge base um, question or the knowledge base skills within the unit of competencies and turned it into a question. Or the other thing they do is they do the performance criteria and convert that to a observation checklist, which is not observable skills. Observable skills is what should the assessor be looking for? If they're observing something, what should the student be demonstrating to the assessor? And that is the observable skill. So it's really identifying, okay, as an assessor, and these instructions to me as an assessor, I, I can go through this list and I know exactly what I should be observing the student doing within the workplace or within the assessment task, uh, whatever the case may be. Um, make sure that uh, the evidence practical application of the knowledge base and, and the skills is being applied and, and that it's relative to the industry sector that they're working in. So you want to make sure you know, it's no good getting someone to write an essay or a report if that's not actually a requirement within the position that they would be holding following um, completion of the training. Clearly define benchmarks of what is, uh, what is the minimum requirement that the student must be able to demonstrate within the evidence that you're collecting for assessment. And we also recommend having a range of assessments. Um, and what I mean by that is to be able to give the student uh, an opportunity to be able to demonstrate on a number of occasions that they are competent within that unit. So the different types of assessments could be uh, written assessments. It could be a number of written assessments where they get to, where it's worded differently each time that you have that written assessment. Or it could be a demonstration and a written assessment. It could be an observation. It could be uh, a role play that they do as well as a written assessment. So they're given a number of occasions to be able to demonstrate using the different strengths that the individual student may have to be able to demonstrate that they can uh, undertake this task within the workplace and they're able to provide you with the evidence. The other reason why we like, and, and now we're seeing this a lot within the units of competencies is they're actually stating on a number of occasions. And the reason why is that they're able to apply that skill on a number of occasions, uh, not only in the training, but also in the assessment to be able to demonstrate that they do actually have the skills and knowledge. Um, and looking at different situations where they could demonstrate those skills as well. So having different case studies, having different scenarios, um, having different role plays, where they're able to demonstrate it in different ways. Uh, and then the evidence collected demonstrates what the student did, what was covered and how the assessor made the determination. This is something that we find is lacking in a lot of assessment tools is that determination. What is it that the assessor should be looking for? What is the minimum requirement? If it's a written assessment, what should be in the minimum requirement in the written assessment? Um, you could have a word count uh, requirement, but it could also be um, if it was a report that they need to write, you could have a list of the minimum requirements of what needs to be in the report and how it should be covered. 
I really like assessment tools where it has a defined outcome, where it makes it much easier for you to conduct the assessment. And what I mean by that is putting together a case study and having all of the students complete the same requirements uh, within the case study. So that way, you know what the answers are going to be. If the case study happens to be something that they need to work in the, do in the workplace and they're able to demonstrate it in the workplace, how are you going to make sure you're going to have consistency of assessments with what they're doing within the workplace? What evidence are they bringing back? Um, that should be clearly defined for the assessor when they're marking the assessments. Third party reports. So third party reports are really good for being able to demonstrate that the student has done it on a number of occasions uh, within the workplace. Uh, it also is a really good evidence base uh, for them applying it within the workplace. Uh, but what we find with uh, third party reports is it's not very clear to the third party what they're supposed to do within the assessment task. Um, the instructions aren't clear of how uh, the student, what the student is to do uh, on the job or within the workplace. And it's not, not clear in the instructions of what the workplace supervisor uh, may be required to do. The other thing is, is if you do have a workplace supervisor, what is the minimum skills and knowledge that they need to have? Do they need to hold a qualification? Do they need to have a minimum number of years of experience within that area as a supervisor or even um, working in the role that they are uh, uh, observing uh, within the third party. So you've got to be really careful with that third party evidence that we're making it easier for the third parties to be able to complete because I often find that uh, the third party evidence that we're requiring supervisors to collect is so complicated that they just end up ticking on every page because they just don't know exactly what they're supposed to be doing. So make sure that it, those instructions are clear, uh, but also make sure that what you're requiring the supervisor to do in the workplace is actually doable within the work, workplace. And we're not taking out too much of their time in completing paperwork in order to provide evidence of uh, being able to conduct it in, in the workplace. But on the other hand, it is also really good evidence to collect, but just don't make it hard uh, for supervisors to be able to complete them. Where if you have a requirement for work placement as part of your training, make sure that it's really clear, you need to have it mapped out within your delivery and assessment plan, when are they to do work placement? What are they required to do? There might be certain units that they need to complete before they can go on to into the workplace. So for example, in childcare, they have to have completed a first aid unit, uh, working with children check, and they should have done the very basic of what is what it is to work within a childcare center. So you should have that mapped out within your delivery and assessment plan of what is required of the student before they go into the workplace. If they're required to use different equipment within the workplace, you need to make sure that they've had access to that and had some practice on that equipment before they go into the workplace. So it should be really clear within your delivery and assessment plan, that whole process of when uh, they can go into the workplace, what are they required to do when they're in the workplace? Is there assessments that need to be conducted? Is there a third party report? How are they supposed to use all of these documents? So your instructions need to be really clear there for the student and for the employer supervisor. You also need to ensure that you're assessing that the workplace that they're going to be working in is suitable to meet the requirements of the unit that you're delivering. An example I could give you here is if you were delivering commercial cookery as one of your qualifications, and the student's workplace was very uh, defined in one area. And an example I can give you uh, that I have seen uh, actually happen within the workplace is the student was completing commercial cookery uh, qualification. The client they had was uh, a company that does pasta. And all they basically do is the pasta's already made, all they've got to do in the workplace is boil the water and put the pasta in and heat up the sauce. 
So then they actually don't have any opportunities within the workplace to be able to demonstrate knifing skills, um, how to cut up meat, uh, how to prepare vegetables. Uh, all of that is all taken away within the workplace because they've just made it really easy with this pasta process. So you need to be able to identify, well, how else can you collect that evidence? It doesn't mean they can't do a traineeship in commercial cookery. It just means that you're going to have to find a way for them to be able to, for you to be able to collect the evidence that they know how to apply all of these skills within a work and a simulated environment. So it could be a workplace or a simulated environment. So you need to really look at your units of competencies and what are the requirements of those units? And is the workplace suitable? Will you be able to collect sufficient evidence of them demonstrating their skills and knowledge within that workplace? Um, and will you need to provide other measures for, your, um, for you to collect evidence? Is it that all of the evidence is going to be collected within a training room? Can you actually do that? Does it, you need to have a look at the unit of competency. Does it define within the unit that it needs to be in a workplace environment? Uh, all of these conditions are listed within the assessment conditions of each unit of competencies. You really need to identify what those skills and knowledge are that is required before they go into the workplace. I've already covered that um, and make sure that it's clear what the purpose of the work placement is. It's not just to meet a minimum requirement of hours of uh, being in the workplace. What unit does it apply to? What should they, what should be conducted while they're in the workplace? What should be observed? What third party evidence are you collecting? What is the purpose of the third part of the um, work placement? And how are you ensuring that you've collected sufficient evidence that they have the skills and knowledge uh, within the units that they're deli you're delivering? You need to also make sure that you've got written agreements in place for all parties. So that includes the employer, the student and the RTO. On uh, Unicorn, we actually have a, uh, a work placement document, MOU, that you can access that is between the employer, the RTO and the student. If you haven't downloaded and used this yet, I do highly recommend that you get access to that document um, on Unicorn and use that for your work placement because it's really good because it clearly defines the roles and responsibilities of each party involved. So the RTO, the student, and the employer. So if you have a requirement for students to do, use, uh, do work placement, uh, download that MOU uh, document because that's really gonna help you. So the best way to be able to identify that whether your assessment tools are compliant is to conduct assessment validation. Now we do a whole day workshop on assessment validation. So I'm not gonna go into details about this, but basically, it's making sure that you're validating the assessment tools against the unit of competency requirements. And that's some of the things that we're going to be having a look at today is looking at those, um, um, how to map those units and identify that you are actually meeting the unit of competency requirements. So I'll get that one open and ready to go. All right, okay. So um, the best way to ensure that your assessment tools are compliant is by conducting assessment validation uh, and it's mapping those units to uh, the performance criteria and the assessment conditions, so mapping the assessment tools and making sure that you're, you are collecting sufficient evidence um, and the way you're conducting the assessment. Now, if we have any questions, the chat's very quiet today. So uh, if you have any questions, don't forget uh, to pop it in the chat. Okay, I'm not going to go through all of the assessment validation requirements because I want to focus today on this mapping. So I'm going to switch screens now and I'm going to go on to training.gov.au. Now, uh, something I would recommend while you're on here today is get on to TGA, get on to training. So sh you should lo log in to training.gov.au um, right now and you can play along with me. So you don't have to do exactly what I'm doing. You should have a look at the units that you deliver. So what are the units that you deliver and uh, use them as an example. So I'm just gonna choose um, some commonly known units that we're going to have a look at 
um, but you might want to choose some units of your own that you deliver. So I'll give you a little bit of time to open up training.gov.au. Um, I'll just pop that in the chat for you. So the link is there. Um, so it can make it much easier for you to just jump into training.gov.au. I'm in the new look training.gov.au. So um, you can go, uh, you may go to this version, this old uh, version of uh, training.gov.au. They're uh, actually relaunching a whole new training. Is it the whole lot's going to change? Um, the whole the whole way it looks, but they've been testing this new search function to see if it's um, easier for people to use um, and how do they feel about uh, the new search functions that they've got on here. There's a whole heap of new reports that they're going to be bringing onto training.gov.au as well. Uh, there's a heap of new um, improvements that they're doing. Uh, there hasn't been a major update to training.gov.au for a very long time. So this is something they really need, really needs a refresher as well. Okay, so you should be in there now. So what I like about it is with the new look, uh, it's much easier to do a search for an RTO or a training product. So you can um, actually go into here and look up training products. So I'm just going to do uh, TAE because um, as trainers and assessors, we pretty much know what TAE is and search for in training and assessment. Uh, so I'm going to be looking at some units and the qualifications uh, within TGA. Way better with the autofill. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Um, yes, I went, moved through that quite quickly. But you see, it has the autofill now. So you can actually go directly to the training product that you're looking for um, by just typing in a couple of letters. Yeah, I think it's a minimum of three letters that you need to type in there. Um, but you can do a search on all sorts of things. So, uh, so it's really, really good that way. Uh, I find that function is really easy and good to be able to follow. Okay, um, the other one is you can look up RTOs by their RTO ID, um, but you can also, uh, uh, it'll search for names as well, which is quite good. Okay, so I'm looking at the cert for in training and assessment. I'm just going to break this down for you um, when we're looking at delivering a single unit. So I'm not going to go through uh, the full call because we cover that in the assessment validation workshop and how to map that. Um, so I'm just going to look at uh, single units uh, and I'm just randomly selecting because it doesn't really matter uh, for the demonstration purposes. But uh, as I said earlier, I do recommend that you do go onto TGA yourself and look up some of your own units. So there's some great things and tools that you can use on training.gov.au. We use this every day. We're on here every single day. More often than not, maybe five to 10 times a day, we might be on here uh, looking up different things. So we'll look up units and the qualification. Uh, we we'll also look at the, what's really important is these companion guides because they actually really help you with your training and assessment as well. Um, often the companion guide will have additional information that you can include in your training and assessment strategy, um, but it also has information uh, around how to conduct the training and assessment as well. So it's a really good breakdown uh, within there. So I've gone to TAE Dell 401, which is plan, organize and deliver group-based learning. So I'm having a look at this unit. And if we go down the bottom, now I can actually down, you can download the Word or the PDF uh, version, uh, depending on what you would like to do. But it's also all listed down underneath as well. So you don't actually have to download the Word or the PDF version if you don't want to. When I conduct assessment validation, I download the PDF version and I put comments in the PDF version and that's how I conduct it. So I've got all of my evidence in there of assessment validation within the PDF. Okay, so when we look at a unit, we really need to have a look at the elements and the performance criteria. That's uh, one of the key areas. Foundation skills and the assessment requirements. These are the key areas that we're looking at to ensure that we're collecting sufficient evidence. So what I'm going to be going through here now is how can you write an assessment or improve an assessment? So if you've had a training package update, there's a new release that's come out, 
and you now need to rewrite your assessment tools to meet the new requirements um, of the unit, this is what you could basically do. Um, you can do a comparison, so you can compare the unit, the new unit to the old unit. So you can take the uh, latest assessment requirements and have a look at, so you might have had release one uh, before and now we've moved to release two. You can do a comparison to find out what is the difference between this unit, the old unit and the new unit and what's changed. Um, if there's any, so there's nothing that's changed in the performance evidence, uh, the knowledge base, if it looks like they've added, it looks like nothing's been changed. They must have, oh, they've just changed what the assessor must hold. So the assessor qualifications in that. So that's not much that you need to do, but I know the business ones, there's been some major changes in there. So that's where it's really good for that mapping. Um, and what you want to do is have a look at what the differences are from the new unit, from the old unit, and what you put in is all the new uh, requirements within your assessment tools. So when you're writing an assessment, you should be looking at each of these elements and then the performance criteria and making sure that your uh, assessment tools match all of these. Now, if you don't have a mapping tool, for your assessment tools, this is a good time to do mapping because you could actually map it onto this document. So if you've got the Word document, you could download that, add a column, and then you can map it to your assessment tools. Um, you can also uh, update your uh, mapping tool as well. Okay, so the first uh, element is interpret learning environment and delivery requirements. Then you would need to look at the performance criteria of what uh, the performance criteria basically tells you the evidence, the type of evidence that you should co have collected. Now, what's more important than looking directly at the element and the performance criteria is the foundation skills, because you'll often find that the foundation skills are a part of the unit. So you'll see here in the foundation skills, they've got reading skills, writing oral communication, navigate the world of work, interact with others and get the work done. So when we have a look at these, the oral communication says uses communication techniques to build rapport and explore requirements. So I already know I'm going to want to see in your assessment tools, or if I'm writing assessment tools, that I'm going to need to write a observation checklist or role play um, or something where I'm observing the student using different communication techniques to build rapport. So that's the evidence that I need to collect. So if I was writing an assessment tool right now, I'd be looking at scenarios that I could put together and an observation uh, where I'm collecting evidence of this. The next one is facilitates training in an appropriate style for both individuals and groups. So I wanna be able to see evidence of the student delivering training to individuals and groups. And that's part of their um, assessment, the evidence that I'm collecting, and they're using oral communication skills as part of that. So it could be oral questioning, or it could be a role play scenario uh, where they're demonstrating the types of communication skills required to for them to be able to conduct this. Um, you saw that I jumped straight down to oral communication, reading and writing is often within the assessment tool. We, we generally don't find a lot of gaps in this area. What we do find is there's a lot of gaps in collecting sufficient evidence of oral communication skill. The other one is this one, interact with others. So interact with others uh, states, cooperates and collaborates with others as part of routine activities to achieve team results and to confirm that outcomes meet requirements. So I would wanna see within the assessment tool that right, this is definitely a role play sort of scenario that you would have here, where you can also control the outcome of the assessment. So you know what the student must be performing. It could be a combination of doing it on the job, but it could also be, a, a role play is really good for being able to control uh, that outcome recognizes inappropriate behaviors and the potential for conflict. So I could write a role play 
that includes conflict. And I'd have an observation checklist to observe how they um, how they work with that conflict and how do that what do they do to resolve the conflict. Uh, and implement strategies to maintain an appropriate learning environment. So um, with the maintain, uh, implement strategies to maintain an appropriate learning environment, uh, that could be writing strategies. Uh, it could be they're putting together um, a scenario for their training. Uh, so they, this is a combination of observation, but it could also be a written assessment as well. Going to the foundation skills will really help you to identify what should be in your assessment tools. It can tell you exactly the types of assessment tools that you should have in place. So I already know there's going to be a observation that's going to be required. Um, I'm also can see that there would be a role play that would be required. Now, if we move down to get the work done, uh, organises and completes work according to defined requirements, taking responsibility for decisions and sequencing tasks to achieve efficient outcomes. So within the requirements of the unit up here, the elements and the performance criteria, I'd want to see some sort of assessment task where the student is required to sequence tasks, put them in the right order, and how to achieve those outcomes um, and what, what, what are their responsibilities uh, within that task. Identifies and responds to problems and opportunities for improvement and considers options for different approaches. So I would want to see in the assessment that there is a problem solving activity that the student is required to resolve. And that could be incorporated with the interact with others assessment. Uh, they could very easily be incorporated together within a role play. Uh, uses information and communications technology based uh, tools to access, organize, analyze, and display different relevant, uh, di different uh, display information relevant to the role. So I could uh, see there being a case study or it could be a report that they need to write uh, where they're identifying uh, different uh, communication technology that they could use. And, and when we think about the training that we're delivering with this unit is all around group training. Uh, I could see that we could do an assessment task based around scenarios, role plays. Um, we could also have a report or we could also get them doing a plan, putting together a plan uh, for a group training activity. So foundation skills are really the key to a lot of assessment tools. It's where you can identify how should assessment tool be conducted or used? What should be within the assessment tool? Um, it, it can really tell you the type of assessment tool that would be the best type of assessment tool to meet all of these requirements. So once you've gone through the foundation skills, so I've already identified a few different um, uh, methods that you could use for your assessment. Then I would go back up here and have a look at the elements and the performance criteria. So if we look at the second one, the second one is prepare session plans. So I would expect that the student would be required to complete a session plan. Uh, refine existing learning objectives according to program requirements and specific needs of individual learners. Develop session plans and document these plans for each segment of the learning program. So you see this aligns with the uh, tools and access and analyze and display information and also the getting it into sequence. So there were, I think it was up here somewhere. Uh, there was one where they had to get it into sequence. So yeah, there we go, the first one there. So that would tie in and you can see here they've even mapped it. So they've mapped the performance criteria to the, uh, or sorry, the element to the unit so that you can, uh, to the foundation skills, so you know where they're embedded in there. Um, but you can see just by reading them what they uh, would relate to. Uh, develop session plans and document these plans. Use uh, knowledge of learning principles and theories to generate ideas for managing session delivery. So I would expect the student would do some sort of research into different delivery methods and the theories of those methods for putting together a session plan. 
Uh, and that would be part of the assessment task is them doing the research into different methods uh, uh, that they could implement within that session plan. So it's not just the session plan uh, outline, it's also what needs to be within the session plan. So by reading this, I know that they're going to need to put together a session plan, but they also need to identify the different theories uh, that need to go into there um, and then how they're going to apply it. When we move further down, they've got resources, deliver and facilitate the training session. So this is where uh, the communication skills would come in. So they would be conducting each session according to the session plan meeting the learner cohort needs. So I would in the role play or in the scenario that you're using, I would define who your learner cohort is within the assessment tools so that you know what the student is required to do to contextualize their session plans for the learner cohort. So this is where the instructions to the assessor is very, very important and the instructions to the uh, student as well. So you're making sure it's very, very clear what is supposed to be included within that assessment. Um, so because it's got in here modified where appropriate to meet learner needs, you should have a defined outcome of yes or no, does the student, is the student required to do this? And then if they did, what were they required to do or what did they do? to adjust the training to meet the learner cohort needs. So you could specify the learner cohort that is going to be in this scenario that you're delivering. So you could have a scenario where uh, the trainer is required to put together a session plan for a new entrance uh, into the workforce who are going to be doing, and you could even specify a unit if you wanted to, um, or you could specify a training product uh, where they're writing the uh, session plan for. Uh, and that would be then really defining what would be the outcomes, the observable outcomes, but also the skills, knowledge, skills and knowledge that you are to assess, uh, collect evidence of. Use the diversity of the group as another resource to support learning. So you're looking at different resources that will uh, support the different types of students. So I would say in this scenario, you would have different types of students within the one training. So it could be new entrants, existing workers, uh, it could be you know, um, uh, English as a second language. Uh, there could be a range of different areas or scenarios that you could put into the assessment tool to meet this diversity requirement. Employ a range of delivery methods to optimize learner experiences. So I'd wanna see different types of delivery methods uh, that uh, you are assessing the student on and that they're able to uh, create different types of delivery me methods uh, for their session plan. Demonstrate effective facilitation skills to ensure effective participation and group management. So um, this would be an observation, this facilitation skills. And what is effective facilitation skills? So you need to have this defined within your assessment tool. Um, if you're doing an observation, what should the assessor be observing that would uh, demonstrate that the student knows what effective facilitation skills are. So you should put within the scenario different outcomes that they could achieve with this effective uh, facilitation skills. So what adjustments do they need to make for the learner cohort? Um, it might be you give them a scenario where um, uh, something happens within the training and they've got to adjust the training to meet the learner cohort needs. So that's a really a uh, good way to be able to identify that the student, you know as an assessor, that the student is able to demonstrate effective uh, foundation skills. Uh, Kirsten's popped something in the chat. Uh, it would be great to see how you recommend the interpretation of implicit foundation skills. So implicit is uh, you're talking, so implicit is they're included within the unit. So, um, so you'll find that some, some units when you go in, 
uh, that it'll, it won't have this table. It'll say uh, foundation skills and they'll say the foundation skills have been um, implicitly listed within the unit of competency. Some of them will say it's in italics. So it's actually might be in within the uh, element or the performance criteria and it might be italicized. That makes it much easier because then you know exactly where uh, those foundation skills may be. It could be that within the performance criteria, it is so clear what is required to be collected as evidence that you don't need any foundation skills because it is fully embedded within the performance criteria of the unit. So as long as you are collecting sufficient evidence of the performance criteria, then you've collected sufficient evidence. Um, whenever it's embedded within the uh, performance criteria, it's just this, this part. So you see I'm, I'm jumping back and forth. So I'm jumping up to the performance criteria and down to the foundation skills. Basically, if they were embedded within, I'd be looking for keywords within the performance criteria that would demonstrate that uh, what would be the foundation skills that they need to have within the unit. So you'll see in here, um, there's doing words in here. There's also, you know, this demonstrate effective facilitation skills. Um, even if I didn't have foundation skills here that said uh, oral communication and interact with others, I still know that I need to collect sufficient evidence that the student knows how to demonstrate this. And I know it's going to be communication skills because, or it's going to be um, with effective um, facilitation skills. It could be how they've written their session plan. And we've got to go back to the element where it says deliver and facilitate training sessions. So they're actually delivering the training. Um, so how are they doing that effectively? And you'll want to observe, like it could be an observation if you didn't have these foundation skills. It could be in writing, like they're able to respond to questions um, or you've given them a scenario and they've got to come up with a solution uh, to those questions within there. So yeah, so the, it, it can be uh, confusing if you don't have that. I like the foundation skills because it really does define uh, what needs to be within the unit. But then there are some units that it's so clear what those foundation skills are that they don't need to be stipulated separately because uh, they're already within the performance criteria. So it just depends on the unit. So I hope I answered your question there, Kirsten. Uh, and I'm saying there might be someone who's online who had that question uh, specifically about uh, those embedded uh, or implicit foundation skills. Great, thank you, awesome. Okay, all right, so um, so if you don't have foundation skills, it's still just looking at that unit. Then the next bit is making sure that you're looking at the assessment requirements. Um, and before I go through all of these, I would read everything first and then look at, like I'll just do an overview and go, yep, I know there'll be an observation, there'll be a scenario, there'll be a demonstration, like I know the type of assessments that they're going to need. I know they're going to need to write an assess a session plan, they're going to have to deliver it, they've got to identify what the resources are going to be required uh, to deliver that training. So I know all of that. Now I'm having a look at the uh, performance evidence. The candidate must show evidence of the ability to complete the tasks outlined in the elements and the performance criteria of the units, including facilitating group-based learning by preparing and delivering at least three training sessions. So I know there needs to be three occasions. So there's going to be three session plans and there's going to be three different delivery occasions that they're going to be delivering. So I already know now all of these other assessments that I've already identified, they're gonna to have to do it three times. At least two consecutive sessions of at least 40 minutes duration. So I know they're going to need to write two consecutive uh, sessions, but they could do three, or no, I think the other one's down below. Um, they could do two consecutive sessions with that, that has to be a 40 minute duration. Uh, the, fo the follow that follow one of the learning program designs to a learner group of at least eight individuals. So there needs to be eight students in the class. Uh, so this is defining what I need to have in my scenarios. Uh, or if they're doing work based, I know what they need to have in their work base. So I'm going to be writing my assessment tools based on what it's stating in here. 
not word for word, but I need to embed it within the scenarios that I'm going to be using. At least one session delivered to a learner group of at least eight individuals with evidence of how the characteristics and needs of this group were addressed. And this is where uh, a scenario is really good because a student who may be delivering training themselves, if they were to select their own scenario, is gonna make it much harder for you to be able to assess their ability to be able to meet the different characteristics. Whereas if you identify in the assessment, you have uh, eight students, you know, A, B, C, D, E, like you actually name them, Adam, Brian, Don, Catherine, you actually name them all within there. And then you say, this student, this is their characteristics. This student, this is their, this is their background. They're long-term unemployed. Uh, Catherine has recently been made redundant. Uh, you, you would make these characteristics out. And the reason why you would do this is when you go to conduct the assessment, you know what you are looking for as an assessor because it's already been defined, these different characteristics within your scenario. So uh, as an assessment, that's where I would really see, I'd want to see if I was validating that you have those scenarios in there. Identifying and responding to individual needs. So I would have within the characteristics, the individual needs and that in their session plan, they've identified those, how they're going to address those individual needs. Accessing and using documented resources and any support personnel uh, required to guide inclusive practices. So you could incorporate that within your scenario that you're using as well. Okay, so this is another really important area where when you're writing your assessment is looking at those assessment requirements and how can you embed that within the whole training. So you could have one scenario, or in this case, three scenarios, because we know we've got to do it on three different occasions. So it could be two scenarios because one is at least two sessions um, running concurrently. So you could have that running um, within two session plans. Uh, and then I know that I could incorporate all of this within um, a case study. So you could do a case study, you could do a role play, you could do, um, so, so that's two scenarios. And the third one could be on the job. It could be one that they actually conduct themselves. So it could be a, a session that they actually conduct within a workplace or something like that. So then we've got our three scenarios and they're three different types of scenarios. The role play is really good for practicing as well within the training room. Um, and then you can do the um, uh, observations and things like that. Okay, uh, knowledge-based evidence is, is normally and quite often embedded within the unit or you may have, um, you may have knowledge-based questions in a separate assessment task. So if we have a look at this one, the candidate must be able to demonstrate essential knowledge uh, to effectively complete the tasks outlined in the elements and the performance criteria. So that's what's up here within there. Uh, and uh, the, this includes knowledge of learning theories. So that could be within the learning theories could be included within your scenario. So you could have that scenario and they've got to come up with different learning theories, um, which they'd need to research and include it within their report. Uh, resources available. So that comes up um, under the uh, element three, prepare resources for delivery. So they would be doing research for that um, and identifying the different learner styles. Uh, the relevant industry area and subject matter. So I'd make sure that you actually define what the unit is uh, for as part of this assessment task. So it makes it easier for you to mark as an assessor um, as well. Uh, the learner group profile, including, um, including the characteristics and needs of individual learners uh, within the group uh, is in there as well. Uh, the requirements of the learning program and or delivery plan and the content and purpose. So a lot of these knowledge-based evidence, um, you could have some knowledge-based questions that could be part of their forming, so their forming skills. Um, but 
you would also be collecting evidence of this within the final assessment. So it would be within your scenarios, your role plays or on the job. So these, these are like I often see that most people just turn knowledge-based questions into uh, knowledge-based evidence into questions. It's not always necessary. It's not always required. There are better ways of doing it, um, particularly if you can incorporate it into the training that you're delivering. It makes it so much easier for the student and the assessor for collecting that evidence um, and, and evidence that they're able to demonstrate that knowledge within their skills that they're uh, demonstrating. Okay, within here, we have some assessment conditions. Gather ev evidence to demonstrate consistent performance in conditions that are safe and replicate the workplace. So it can be a scenario that could be in a simulation. They don't need to um, actually be in the workplace so far. Conditions must be typical of those experienced in the training and assessment environment and include access to learning programs, design, learning program designs in use in the learning environment. So this, uh, this assessment could all be conducted within the classroom. Um, they don't actually have to be delivering the training, um, but you can, if you wanted to, you could have it, as I said, they, you could have your three session plans that they've got to develop, two they do within the classroom, one they could do in the workplace, or you could do all three uh, they're doing in the classroom, or you could have all three you do in the workplace, depending on how you're delivering it. Um, and then it just says the assessors must meet the requirements of the assessors. Uh, so as to deliver a TAE unit, you've got to hold the diploma or above. Any questions around writing assessment tools and looking at the unit of competency, the element, the performance criteria, have you got any questions? Um, if you don't have any questions, any comments? I'd just like to know you're alive, you're listening, you're not just there me babbling in the background <laughs> yes listening all right awesome rio's listening um any feedback on that amanda's giving me some love hearts <laughs> awesome paul awesome um so you've got it you've got it all there you're understanding it awesome all right good so what i would like you to do now um we're almost finished now but what i would like you to do after this is make sure you're having a look at a couple of your units just have a look at one just one unit and just do what I just did then and identify, don't look at your assessments. Don't have any look at your assessments at all. Just look at these units, just like what I just did there and go through it and identify what would be the best assessment tools? How should we be conducting it? What evidence should we be collecting? Exactly what I just did then. Then go to the assessment tool and read the assessment tool and see, does it actually address all of this? Because often if you do it this way, instead of looking at the assessment tool first, if you do it this way, you will actually find uh, improvements that you could make. It could be that the assessment tool needs to be totally rewritten. It could be that there's just some adjustments that need to be made um, to improve that assessment tool for both the student and the assessor. So um, I highly recommend that you, as one of your uh, compliance requirements, you should also be conducting assessment validation, but just at least one unit, just go through this process of what I just have gone through today. And then uh, that should certainly help you with uh, identifying what you've got within your assessment tools. Now, um, questions. Otherwise, I'm going to go back to PowerPoint just to finish off. No questions? I must have explained that really clearly. <laughs> Amanda, sometimes you might think of a really engaging way to perform your assessments and decide to restart from scratch. Yeah, yeah, I've done that quite often where I've read the unit first because that's what I do. When I validate, I read the unit first. I know what I'm expecting. Then I go to the unit and I go, oh, is it meeting that requirement? Are you, is this assessment just making it so hard for the student and the assessor? Is there an easier way to do this? Um, and is there a less time consuming way of doing it? I'm always about cutting back on time and uh, making it easier for both the student and the assessor. Okay, um, uh, great feedback there, Amanda. 
Okay, so um, RPL is included within this. So you need to make sure you've got a good RPL process. So um, just what I did just then, you could do the same thing for an RPL process. So it's really looking at, if you're looking at doing RPL, what existing skills and knowledge would you expect that they would have? And you map it to the unit and what's within the unit and the elements within there. Uh, and then you should write your RPL assessment based on that evidence that you should be collecting. So for that scenario, that was group-based learning. If I was collecting evidence of that, I'd want to see session plans. So if I was conducting RPL, I'd want to see three, at least three session plans that they've written. Uh, I'd want to see evidence of them delivering training and assessment in a group environment. So it could be um, attendance sheets, it could be a letter from their employer, um, it could be some um, uh, uh, professional development that they've done, so non-accredited training like this, they could have done some training like this uh, as well, that could go towards it as well. Um, I'd want to look at all of that uh, different types of evidence that they've collected. I'd mostly want to see some sort of observation as well because of those uh, communication skills. It could be oral based thing that I could just ask different questions about training that they've delivered and then how they're answering those questions. So you really should look at that unit and there should be, be the evidence that you're collecting to demonstrate that they know those skills and uh, knowledge. Hey Angela, would love to have a session on how to develop RPL toolkits. Um, yes, I've been wanting to do this <laughs> for a while, um, but basically it's the same uh, as that, as I, I just said then, it's really looking at, and I could do a whole course on this, um, it would be longer than an hour uh, where I could really uh, break this down because it's, uh, and it's really using these steps, so obtain, um, uh, we've, we've got a kit, we've got a template that's uh, within Unicorn, so for all of our superhero members, you can access that within Unicorn. Uh, and then it's really looking at that contextualization of the RPL kit to the units or uh, unit or units, uh, if you have a range of them, and really looking at how it would be used to be able to collect that evidence to, uh, to be able to demonstrate. Um, and a lot of people get lost with this um, uh, assessment requirements with RPL and how much evidence is sufficient evidence. Sufficient evidence is su sufficient evidence to be able to demonstrate that the student is able to utilise these skill skills within the workplace or already have um, utilised the skills within the workplace. Okay. Um, yes, so we have an RPL kit uh, within uh, uh, Unicorn. Uh, it's actually changed from this one now because it's had a total overhaul this year. I don't know whether we were able to we were able to get the new one up, Amanda, onto Unicorn, or we're still having problems. Um, it's not been turned into the template yet. I don't believe. I think. We... Oh, okay. All right, I've got it. <laughs> I'll get it over to you guys and get it in the Unicorn. Okay. All right. Uh, yeah, because we've got a template. Um, uh, there are ready to go. So what I've basically done is I've, I've also put in instructions in it on how to use the tool um, as well if you're writing an RPL kit. Um, RPL shouldn't be hard. It should be recognising the skills and knowledge that the student already has so or the candidate already has. Um, so the big thing is with the evidence that you're collecting for RPL is that they've already got the skills and knowledge. They've just got to demonstrate that Though that they have those skills and knowledge. Um, and that can be through uh, workplace, it could be through third parties, it could be through a portfolio of evidence. That's one that I really do recommend because there's a whole range of different things they could do. They could deliver an oral presentation. So it just depends on the unit and what's involved within the unit of how you would conduct that RPO. And it's really looking at each unit um, requirement. Okay, um, I haven't got a bit reform update. So uh, the next webinar is the 4th of October. Uh, we're getting towards the end of the year. Uh, next month, we will be going through marketing for both RTO and CRICOS because it's very, very similar, the marketing for both sides. Um, I will be reviewing websites. So I'll be throwing it out there. If you would like your website reviewed, 
um, let us know. Send us an email at support at vivacity.com.au and uh, we can pop your website into the webinar. Um, warning, I will be doing a live review of your website for compliance, evidence of compliance and non-compliance and using it as an example of what to go through uh, within uh, your website to make sure that it's uh, compliant. We'll also be looking at social media marketing and what are the requirements there. Amanda has just uh, popped into the chat. Uh, ASCO have been doing a spotlight series on assessments. Uh, highly recommend. I don't, did they do one on RPL, Amanda? Um, it might be included in the assessment series. Yeah. Yeah, because that would be um, that would be good if they've done that. I haven't had a look at them yet. I did post them in the membership uh, group, uh, but yes, I do recommend uh, get on to those uh, spotlight on series. Uh, the great thing is with the recordings, you can fast forward through the bits that because sometimes they just chat about things that aren't relevant. Um, so you can fast forward through those. Uh, but yeah, it's it's uh, quite good. The spotlight on series, they're getting some really good feedback on them. And uh, please use them because the reason why ASQA had to do these series is because of the feedback that they received from RTOs about not being taught what is compliance and what they need to have in place. If we don't use them, we might lose them. So make sure that you are using them. There are live spot on, uh, spotlight on series uh, that you can uh, attend as well, which you, uh, I think that link will take you there as well where you can register for the live uh, but they're all recorded something else i recommend you do and i don't know whether kira has got the link there um uh youtube asqua have a youtube channel so they have a youtube channel and all of their videos are on there a uh, great resource uh, so the spotlight ons are on there as well if you subscribe to the their YouTube channel. Thank you, Kira. Uh, Kira's just popped it in the chat. Um, you've just sent it to me and the panelists, so you'll need to redo that to everyone. Um, uh, if you subscribe to that channel, you'll get updates of when new videos are uploaded. So uh, then you'll always have those up to up to date. Uh, I subscribe to it. I, I use it all the time. I find it quite good. Um, as I said, I can fast forward through bits that I don't want to listen to, uh, but I can also rewind if, uh, if need be to uh, hear exactly what, what they're on about. So I do recommend uh, subscribing to the YouTube channel. Then you'll always get updated of when they come through. The Spotlight On series, I also uh, tell you about it in their newsletter. So it comes up in the newsletter as well. So I highly recommend you get on there. Okay, so that's it for today. I hope you found it very useful. Uh, if you have missed anything or you'd like to watch it again because you just can't get enough of me, uh, you can go on to Vivacity Training because this session has been recorded um, and you'll be able to access it on Vivacity Training. Has it been recorded? <laughs> I don't know where that is. Yes, it is. It's being recorded. Good. Um, so you can access the recording on Vivacity Training and uh, uh, within the, uh, by the end of the week, we should have it up there. We're just training some new team members um, on how to do all of this. So we'll get our videos up there soon. So thank you very much. I'll see you on the 4th of October. So the first Monday of the month, next month. Have a great month. Um, I would like to see, there's a lot of people on here who don't come to the masterminds. I'd just like to do a reminder, you're missing out. There's some great stuff that happens on the masterminds. Um, and our clients who are attending regularly are having some incredible, amazing results. So uh, I do highly recommend that you get on the masterminds. So if you're a senior manager or the CEO of an RTO, highly recommend you get onto the masterminds every Monday at um, uh, 10 30 a.m uh, and amanda's just said love the mastermind set me up for the week yeah uh, it does it gets you your tasks uh, ready for the rest of the week also make sure you're getting onto the facebook group because there's some great uh things i i don't email uh information out anymore i post it into the facebook group so if you're not a member of the facebook group there's going to be a lot of content and a lot of updates that you're missing out on um, I don't do the emails because we're finding a lot of our emails are going to junk uh, and they're not being read. So with the Facebook group, the advantage with that is you can watch it 
when you want to watch it or read it when you want to wait, read it. So I put links to different uh, things that are happening within the industry, um, if there's surveys that are happening, and I think Kira's going to put the link in the chat <laughs> for the members group. Uh, but if you're not in there, anybody can join. So anybody who's a member can join the members group. Um, only the superheroes and the VIPs can attend the mastermind So um, on Monday. So if you're a superhero or a sidekick VIP, you can join the mastermind. Uh, but everybody can join the group. So everybody who's a member can join the group. So I recommend you get on there because there's lots of updates that are uh, going on there. Oh, also, latest news. Vivacity Training is going to be released as an app. So you're going to be able to access Vivacity Training on an app as well as the website. So uh, we'll let you know when that happens. Um, it should be by the end of this month, but we'll let you know and we'll certainly be posting along the group. So thank you. Have a great month. 